Welcome everyone to this new Guru Talk. We have the privilege today to have Craig Van Grastek, professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And the title he chose for his presentation is The Pandemic, the United States and the World. Will it accelerate or reverse the withdrawal? Craig Van Grastek, according to The Economist, has a sharp eye on the politics of trade. His book on trade and American leadership the Paradox of Power and Wealth from Alexander Hamilton to Donald Trump examines the shifting place of trade policy in the grand strategy of the United States, from independence to the struggle with China for global primacy. He also wrote the history and future of the World Trade Organization, as well as numerous other books, articles, and monographs. Dr. Van Grastek has taught courses on trade policy at the Harvard Kennedy School since 2000, having also taught international economics at the American University School of International Service and literature at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He has lectured in the diplomatic academies of the United States, the United Kingdom, and 10 other countries. He received his doctorate in political science from Princeton University and a Master of Science in Foreign Service degree from Georgetown University. He has provided advisory, analytical, and training services to numerous international organizations, national governments, and private firms in over four dozen countries. And if you allow me, before starting, Craig, when we were publicizing and mentioning and talking to all our networks about your presentation, we have different. We had different kind of reaction reactions, and I had someone who told me, "Well, if the U.S. just accounts for four percent of the world's population." Why should the rest of the world curl if withdrawal or is accelerated or withdraw? The withdrawal or reverse is good news for the user or for the world. Or the withdrawal or reverse is bad news for the user for the world. And the last kind of remark that we have is reverse or withdrawal could result in an improved win-win option for the USA and for the world. Or is this mission impossible? So uh, our vice president will chair the, the session and she will manage the, the questions. So please, Manuela, can you tell us how the session will be conducted? Yes, thank you, Alejandro. Welcome, everybody. The first thing that I would kindly ask to everybody is to close the mic because otherwise we will have some uh, audio problems, of course, except uh, Craig, uh, Craig's mic. Uh, I will try to manage, as usual, uh, the discussion insofar as possible. Uh, please, uh, uh, after Craig's presentation, write a, a very short uh, sentence with your key issue, question, or comment in the column uh, at the right side of your screen for the chat. And I will try to uh, organize a little bit so far as possible the questions so that there is some uh, uh, coherence in, in, uh, in the way uh, Craig can answer to them. But of course, feel free also to intervene at, at any time, uh, even in the discussion. Uh, so Craig, the floor is yours. Anything between 20 to 30 minutes is absolutely fine with us. You are in our living room. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to talk to you. This is the first time in these several months that everyone has been doing video conferencing that I've done any of it myself. As you may tell from the rather dark background here, I haven't bothered to do what most people are supposed to do, which is put copies of your books behind you so everyone knows not only what you've written, but also put very impressive tomes to make them believe that you're a very erudite person. I'm in my, my, my wife's basement office because normally I spend my time at, at, at my farm, but I've come into town to, to, uh, to, to make this presentation. Let me start by making a little opening comment about the importance of American leadership as I see it, and then try to frame uh, my views on what the pandemic means for the acceleration or reversal of what has been a U.S. withdrawal. Uh, yes, I'm trained as a political scientist. I come from a particular school of political economy, which believes that the system tends towards anarchy. That is to say, relations between states, both in security and in economics, tend towards anarchy if you do not have 
some sense of governance and leadership. And the school of thought that, that uh, you'll find throughout this book on trade and American leadership is the one that I was brought up on, which is something called the theory of hegemonic stability. The notion being that specifically in the area of trade policy, global markets tend to be closed in the absence of leadership. And when we have leadership, global markets tend more towards openness. So if you look at the periods when Great Britain uh, was providing leadership in the 19th century, we were moving towards open markets. If you look at that period between British and American leadership, we have uh, uh, a collapse of the system and we have rampant protectionism. And in US leadership after the Second World War, we have open markets again. Certainly, the United States is not providing that leadership now. Certainly, we have been withdrawing from that leadership. And the argument that I make in that book uh, is one that, in fact, Donald Trump is in a sense overdue because in the school that I was brought up on in, in the 1980s and 1990s, we were anticipating someone like him for a very long time because the objective conditions of American competitiveness were such that we would expect someone to want to make an appeal to protectionist sentiment. And the only thing that was really surprising is how very long it took for someone to come along and do that. Uh, but I argue that Donald Trump is not only overdue, but he's overdone and has gone way too far in a US withdrawal from leadership. So if you want to see my argument about that and, and, and put it all in a trade policy context, uh, again, that's the book to read. Uh, trade in American leadership. But I want to talk about a different book, and I want to wear a different hat today, at least for framing this discussion, because one of the other things that I do besides trade policy is I teach literature. And as Enrique said at, at Georgetown, uh, I taught for a number of years a course that I entitled Fiction and Foreign Policy. And what I try to do in that course is get people to think about interesting issues in foreign policy, the dilemmas that we face, the, the problems that, uh, uh, that are posed in the world, the solutions that we might pursue as perceived in fiction. And by fiction, I mean novels, plays, movies, uh, sometimes poetry. One of the books that I taught was this, The Plot Against America, without the glare. This is Philip Roth's book. Some of you may be familiar with it because there's recently been a mini series on HBO which I haven't seen because I don't get HBO, but at some point I will get it on DVD and I will binge watch it. But this is a book that is really quite prescient. It was written in 2004 and it poses the question, if the United States gets off the path of leadership, can we restore our position in it? That's not really the essential issue that matters to Roth, but it's what I get from the book. Uh, because Roth is writing here a work of alternate history. And if you know the, the genre of alternate history, it's always based on the notion that something that we know happened in history has changed in some fundamental way. A battle went a different way, a war went a different way, an election went a different way. And in his book, uh, the election of 1940 went in a different direction. If you remember Charles Lindbergh, who was famous for flying across the Atlantic, Charles Lindbergh was also famous for being a Nazi sympathizer and being an isolationist. And in this novel, he defeats Franklin Roosevelt in 1940, becomes president, and uh, there ensues a lot of domestic consequences. Roth is very interested in what this means for American Jewry, for example. But that's very interesting to me. What's also interesting is what it means for US foreign policy. And in his book, he implicitly argues that we can right the ship. We can, if we end up in a very bad position, we can correct our course and come back in a relatively uh, rapid fashion. Now, even Roth did not want to argue that the United States could survive four years uh, of an isolationist person who is ill-suited, ill-tempered for the presidency, someone who is fundamentally racist and misogynist and so forth. His, his Lindbergh is not a, not a hero. Uh, he has that presidency last only two years. If you think about where we were in 1940, the world certainly would be a very different place if we had four years without American leadership. So in his novel, The Lindbergh Presidency Lasts Two Years, Franklin Roosevelt manages in an emergency election, something that the US Constitution does not provide for, to be reelected 
and Franklin Roosevelt is back in office in uh, uh, 1943, after the election of 1942, the United States provides leadership and we end up winning the war. Happy ending. Uh, again, not the main focus of the novel, the main focus is actually what's happening diplomat or, uh, domestically within the United States, not what's happening diplomatically in the world. But here's how I'd like to frame my discussion. Can and will the United States right the ship in the same way that Roth suggests? Can we survive four years of uh, really a very serious effort to withdraw the United States from leadership, to become very insular, to go back to some of the worst instincts we've had in our history, uh, and not to play the leading role that we, we had uh, previously? And note that I say only four years, because I start from the assumption, as many people do today in this country, which is if Donald Trump were reelected, and if we had two full terms, eight years of Donald Trump's leadership, we would be in a very, very precarious position. Uh, and you're finding more and more of that if you see what's happening with people who used to be in his administration, uh, with people who have been his national security advisors, who've been a military advisors, who just on the basis of what we've seen within the last several weeks have been arguing that in fact the Republic is in danger. Uh, and if we were to reelect this man, it would have extremely serious consequences uh, for the future of this country. I agree with that. I also believe it would have very serious consequences for the world because whether or not you're going to join me in this assumption, I believe that American leadership is essential in the world. So if I ask myself, Philip Roth's novel from 2004, uh, does life imitate art? Will we see the United States elect Joe Biden rather than Donald Trump? And will this then lead to writing the ship? I could break this question out into three parts and I propose to discuss at least the first two and depending on time, I might also discuss the, the third point. Three questions. One, what's going to happen in this year's election, and what does the pandemic mean for that? Two, what would it mean if Joe Biden were elected, and what does the pandemic mean for that? And three, does the world want us back? That is to say, if the United States is, is offering to provide leadership, is the world asking for American leadership? And what does the pandemic mean for that? And my argument is, uh, throughout here, my thesis, if you prefer, is that what we have is COVID-19 as a catalyst. I think that in the absence of the current pandemic, Trump's chances for re-election would be much better than 50-50. Perhaps not supremely better than 50-50, but better than 50-50. With the pandemic, they are substantially less uh, than 50-50. Uh, so let me go through each one of my points here, starting with the election and why I say what I just said, uh, then turn to what it would mean to have a Biden presidency, and then if time permits, talk about what I think the world may respond to that as. So the question that a lot of you will undoubtedly have in your mind is, who's going to win this election? Where, where does it stand today? Uh, Manuela, if she's going to be mean, will possibly point out that four years ago, she asked me the same question in a meeting that we were having in Geneva. And I said with a certain degree of confidence at that time that Hillary Clinton was going to be elected. That was at a relatively early stage in the campaign, I can tell you that by the end of the campaign, I thought that Donald Trump had about a one in three chance of being elected. And if you look at a victory that was an electoral college victory and not a popular vote victory, uh, that more or less corresponds to, to what I was saying at the end of that period. However, and well, it has a long memory and will recall that I had said that Hillary Clinton would win. Let me say now, that where we stand presently, I think that Joe Biden is in a very strong position, but we have yet to see what will happen. The election is 19 weeks from today. So we have a 19 week countdown in which a great many things may happen. I think there are slightly more opportunities for Trump to dig himself a deeper hole than for Trump to dig himself out of the hole that he is in. But let me be reductive for a moment and say, that as a political scientist, what, what, what I would conclude in looking at American presidential elections in the post-war period, if you look at every president who has sought re-election since Harry Truman in 1948, 
There is a very, very clear pattern as to the outcome of these elections. It's a two-part rule. First part of the rule, incumbents get reelected. We have a very strong habit, a very strong pattern of reelecting the incumbent president with one exception, which is if you have had a recession within the previous two years. If a president seeks re-election and he has had no recession in his four-year term, he gets re-elected. If he seeks re-election and there was a recession in the first two years of his four-year term, he still gets re-elected. We've never had a president who has sought re-election, or at least not in the last 75 years. We haven't had a president who has sought re-election during a recession, but we have had several who have sought re-election when there had been a recession in the prior two-year period and every single one of those was defeated for re-election. It's, it's an iron rule. If you do not have a recession in the preceding two years, you get re-elected. If you've had one, you do not get re-elected. Now you could ask yourself, is this an authentic recession? Because what the Trump people will argue is two things. One is, this is not really a recession that we're in. It's an induced coma that we had to do as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we're going to have is a V-shaped recovery. We're going, as rapidly as the economy contracted, it's rapidly going to bounce back up. And there's a lot of debate among economists now about whether this is feasible, whether this is likely to happen. Uh, looking at, at the previous month's uh, unemployment data and the better results than, than had been expected, some people see glimmers of, of a, uh, a V-shaped recovery. I think of the economists that I listen to, the general consensus is no, many of the jobs that have been lost have been permanently lost, uh, that this is going to be a slow recovery. And it's a recovery that is tied inextricably to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're now starting to see uh, an uptick again in positive results of tests, hospitalizations, and deaths. After we had been on a down, uh, downward motion, we had peaked at about 2,000 deaths a day. We're now down to somewhere between 500 and 1,000, but it looks like it may be ticking up again. To the extent that you begin to open up the economy in the absence of herd immunity or, or a vaccine, the likelihood is uh, that we're, we're going to have sustained economic difficulties and we're going to have uh, sustained health difficulties. The likelihood is, in my expectation, that whether or not we are in a recession, uh, come the November election, we are going to be in a foul national mood. Remembering that we were, or perhaps still are in a recession and are possibly seeing, the argument now is, is it going to be the second wave of COVID-19 or is it instead of a wave, just sort of a continuous fluctuation of, of the original level. So that's one thing to bear in mind is that presidents who have had a recession do not get reelected. Uh, Another point is if you're a real political junkie like me and you pay very close attention to the polls and to where we are headed, you don't pay any attention or you don't pay too much attention to the national polls. So the national polls right now will tell you that Joe Biden is ahead of Donald Trump by anywhere from five to 10 or possibly more points. What you really wanna do is look at the states because as you'll all remember from the previous election, we do not elect presidents on the basis of the national popular vote, we elect them on the basis of the electoral vote where every state has a number of electoral votes equal to its representation in Congress, which is to say the number of people in the House of Representatives plus the two senators, which tends to create a, a, an advantage for Republicans because there are more votes that are locked up in smaller rural states. But nonetheless, uh, We've had Democrats who've been able to, to break what is considered the Republican electoral lock. But we have had cases in the past, George W. Bush and Donald Trump both got elected with less than a majority in the popular vote, having been defeated in the popular vote, nonetheless, they won in the electoral vote. So where does the electoral college projection stand now? I pay very close attention to what different forecasters say about how different states are going to go I will tell you that there's only two types of projections right now. One is the set of projections that sees Joe Biden winning outright. And the only question is, 
does he barely get the, the requisite 270 of the necessary 500, of the 538 electoral votes, 270 are necessary to get elected. Does he get only about that or does he get substantially more than that? There are some that say he, we already think he will get at least his 270 and the question is just how many more will he get than that? And then there are others who are more cautious who say, we see this number of states in the Democratic column, this number of states in the Republican column, here's how many swing states we see. Every single one of those forecasts that I pay attention to sees Biden starting out with more states, more votes than Trump does, and Biden has more paths to victory than Trump does. But if you want my advice for what to look for in the coming months and what to look for on election night, look at two states, look at Florida and look at Pennsylvania. I think that Biden will be assured of victory if he wins either one of those states. And even if he doesn't win both of them, there are still paths to victory that he might have. Donald Trump has to win both of those states in order to win the presidency. Uh, and um, there are a lot of expectations that he'll have a difficulty doing that in Pennsylvania. So uh, look to those. The current polls are favorable. We don't know what's going to happen in the months to come. Uh, as I say, there are more ways that things can go poorly for Trump than, than can go in his favor, but we don't know. But let me say for right now, if, if I had to bet money, I would say the likelihood is uh, that Biden wins. So, second point. Why do I say that with Biden, you're likely to get a restoration of American leadership? If we were talking, very strictly speaking, about trade policy, you might be skeptical about that. You would say, well, isn't it the case that the Democrats are the party of protection and the Republicans are the party of free trade? Yes, that is largely true with a whole lot of asterisks. And one of those asterisks is we've seen under Trump just how quickly uh, Republican orthodoxy can change. And he came in uh, as a very protectionist uh, uh, leader, and he has managed to bring all the Republicans behind him with very few exceptions quite rapidly. The question then arises whether Democrats uh, would take up the mantle of open markets. And if you look at public opinion polling in the United States, there's a larger share of Americans who are optimistic about trade than Americans who are pessimistic about trade. This has been growing over time in the last 10 years or so, and it's been growing more notably in the Democratic base than in the Republican base. And I go into this a little bit in, in my other book, in my, in my book about trade from last year, if you want to read that. I do not anticipate that Biden will present himself as a free trader, but I do anticipate that he will present himself as an internationalist, both as a candidate and as a president. So if you look at the history of the divide between the two parties in the United States, if you look at the Democrats and the Republicans going back to the early days of the two-party system as we have it, which really comes out of the Civil War in, in, in the 1860s, there's really only one issue on which the two parties have almost always been different, and that is on internationalism. Let me do a, a, um, a mental exercise. Imagine that you're a foreigner, you come to the United States, and you want to acquire American citizenship, and you want to be a very active uh, participant in civil society, and you ask me, what party should I join? And I ask, well, that depends on, on what your feelings are about different issues, what's important to you. If you said to me, what really matters to me is race relations, I'd say, well, today, and you say you're very progressive on this issue, I'd say today your bet is to be a Democrat, very definitely, but not in the past. This is an issue on which the parties have radically shifted position over time. If your grandfather or great-grandfather came over and asked me the same question, uh, in the 1890s, anytime from the 1860s through, through the 1900s, I'd say, well, you want to be a Republican because the Republicans are the progressive party when it comes to race relations. Democrats, especially Southern Democrats, are very regressive on this issue. If you came to me and you said, well, what really matters to me is trade policy, I'd say, 
and, and I happen to be a free trader. I want open markets. I'd say right now it's sort of an open question because we don't know how long Trumpism is going to last. But if you asked me this question five years ago, I would definitely say, well, then you want to be a Republican because Republicans are the party of free trade. Democrats are the party of protection. But if your grandfather asked me this question, I would give you just the opposite answer because the one stable issue in the divide between the parties from the 1860s uh, into the 1960s for a century was trade policy and Democrats were the party of free trade and Republicans were the party of protection. And there was no single issue on which they were more thoroughly divided than that. And yet then we had a transition and between the period of what Richard Nixon is the, is the Republican who began moving Republicans towards free trade and Ronald Reagan is the one who completed the process. And in that same period from uh, the late 1960s into the mid 1980s, Democrats, their support was declining. And all this has to do with American business becoming more international and American labor becoming more concerned about international competition. Republicans are associated with business, Democrats with labor. As a consequence, they've changed position. So on various issues, we have a lot of flexibility and the, and the parties over time can change their polarity. And I'm very interested in seeing if ultimately we have had a, a brief period where Republicans have flirted with protection, but once they've booted out Donald Trump, they go back to being the party of free trade, or are we gonna see the parties reverse their polarity again? That's interesting to me, but the one issue on which in all of this period, or certainly since 1900 to the present, we can ignore the 19th century for the moment, Democrats are internationalists. Democrats consistently, especially Democratic presidents, consistently are very supportive of American international engagement, of the rule of law, of the creation of institutions, and the United States providing leadership through those institutions. And Republicans consistently are very skeptical of that. When Republicans take on foreign policy, traditionally they go in one of two directions. One is isolationism, and that is what Donald Trump has tapped into. And Donald Trump did not make the Republican Party an isolation party. Donald Trump brought the Republican Party back to its isolationist roots. And the other thing is, if they want to be very active, they're not all that interested in alliances. They're not all that interested in international law. They're not terribly interested in cooperation. They want to dictate terms and they, they would, they, if necessary, they're more likely to pull out the sword uh, than are the Democrats. Now, Joe Biden in his political uh, career has not been a free trader per se. He has supported some open market initiatives. He has, he has opposed others, but what he is, is interested in the rule of law and internationalism and cooperation and allies. And in that sense, I would fully anticipate that Biden would uh, try to restore American leadership. And if you think about where we have been in the past, and you think about uh, uh, previous presidents who have been given the opportunity to provide leadership, it's always come after a war. So famously, Woodrow Wilson helped to bring the First World War to a conclusion by bringing American power to the side of, of the Allies and, and, and defeating the Central Powers and then proposed and created the League of Nations, which the United States ended up not joining. Uh, Harry Truman uh, uh, led the United States at the end of the Second World War and then helped create uh, the United Nations system, including the attempt to create the International Trade Organization. That doesn't work out, so we fall back on GATT. But again, uh, the reason that the ITO did not work was because the Republicans in Congress would not let Harry Truman uh, join it on behalf of the United States. Bill Clinton, uh, at the end of the Cold War, having, having uh, won that conflict, so to speak, uh, there were a lot of things he wanted to do internationally, including uh, uh, climate change, brought forward a very important treaty on that, which was defeated by Republicans in Congress. Do you see a pattern here? Because we have to notice always is, internationalist democratic presidents who tried to, to uh, advance an ambitious agenda, which has been historically defeated case after case by Republicans uh, who are falling back on a more isolationist uh, approach to, to foreign policy. And this happened to the Versailles Treaty, it's happened to the Havana Charter, 
of the International Trade Organization. This happened with the Climate Change Agreement. And here's the, here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is I fully anticipate that as President uh, Joe Biden would do what he can to, to try to restore American leadership. I fully anticipate that Republicans in Congress, even if they are in the minority, will try and to some extent succeed in thwarting those initiatives. Uh, there's a lot of debate now over what's going to happen, not just in the presidential election, but in the congressional elections. I fully anticipate that Democrats will not only maintain their majority in the House of Representatives, but quite probably will add to it. I also, I've been saying this for about six months and other people thought I was crazy then. Now this is becoming the, uh, the more conventional wisdom uh, that Democrats will retake control of the Senate. Uh, as I say, six months ago, almost no one said that. And today, uh, at least half of the analysts think the Democrats will take the Senate. But it isn't that important. It's important to a certain degree. But having a majority in the Senate does not mean absolutely controlling the Senate. If you absolutely want to control the Senate, you don't want to have 51 of the 100 seats. You want to have 60 of the 100 seats. And although I expect that Democrats will either have 50, and then you get the tie-breaking vote from the Democratic vice president, therefore uh, Democrats control the Senate, or they will outright have control of 51. There's no way after this election they will be anywhere near the requisite 60 votes to have their way on all issues. And as long as Republicans have at least 41 seats, and I anticipate that they will have probably 49 seats in the 100 seats Senate uh, starting next year, they will be in a position to uh, block a lot of action that might be undertaken. So to reiterate, to go back, uh, is my expectation that Biden is more likely to win this election. It's my expectation that he will want to restore American leadership, which means if by this time we've pulled out of the WTO, he'll bring us back into the WTO. Uh, he'll bring us back into the WHO. Uh, we'll have the United States advancing under Biden. A number of initiatives that are more cooperative in nature. Uh, and if you want to, you can think about it as being Biden as a post-war president, just having been the war on COVID-19, if you want to put it in, in, in those terms, that being the inspiration for moving us in a different direction. But as always, when it comes to foreign policy initiatives in the United States, whether they are economic or security related or something else, you always have to pay attention to the domestic fight over these issues, and I fully anticipate uh, that, uh, that Republicans would put up a strong one. So let me just end by making a couple of comments on my third point, and then turn it over to you, because uh, you will have as many views as I will, in fact, more probably on the third issue, which is even if the United States wants to supply leadership, is the rest of the world interested in receiving it? And to bring it back to our question about what the pandemic means for all of this, and I've said, I anticipate that the pandemic will be the catalyst that helps lead Biden get, to get elected. It is also to some extent the catalyst that uh, will promote uh, a greater US interest in, in retaking leadership. But the third issue is what is going to happen to the prestige of the United States and what is going to happen to the prestige of China for that matter as a consequence of this pandemic? Because I think both the largest leading country and the country in second place have both done themselves a lot of damage of late. Uh, and the pandemic has only accelerated that damage. Uh, China certainly mishandled the pandemic early in the process, did a better job later, as did the WHO. Uh, the United States has fumbled it thoroughly. Uh, and in the process, I think a lot of the prestige that Donald Trump has lost for the United States in the preceding three years, he has merely accelerated that process uh, by the missteps that he's made on this issue, on the economy, uh, and on race relations, and some of the truly bizarre actions that he's taken within just the last month or so. Uh, so where are we headed if we have the United States that is very interested in providing leadership, but has been severely weakened by, by the loss of prestige. I hold out some hope that there's a lot of residual goodwill uh, and it's been my, uh, I've noted in the past that when 
Uh, we've had an unpopular Republican president followed by a popular Democratic president. The world really goes out of its way uh, to, to twi- try to show uh, interest in supporting that to the point of what I thought was really quite silly, and, and Barack Obama thought it was quite silly as well, giving him the Nobel Peace Prize for nothing. <laughs> as soon as he took office, basically he was given the Nobel Peace Prize for not being George Bush. Um, I don't know if we're going to see that same type of response in the future. You probably have more insight uh, into that than I do, and I'd be very interested in hearing your your, your comments or questions about that. Uh, but it remains for me uh, an open question. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by my opening comments, other than to say, bringing us back to where I tried to frame this issue from the start, uh, the question of whether we can right the ship, as Philip Roth suggested, uh, could have happened uh, in, in the Second World War. He was optimistic that that could be done depending on the outcome of an election. I am optimistic that uh, on the U.S. side, it can be done. I am somewhat less hopeful about how the world is going to receive. Uh, I have um, an, an ambivalent view with positive and negative uh, observations to make. So I, I will stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Craig. Um, indeed, as you said, I think the third point that you made is, is the one that can uh, really bring us to a discussion, particularly with your last comment on the perceptions from the rest of the world and not only the US perception on its own role in terms of leadership. And uh, here already I have a question uh, coming from Rolf who doesn't seem to share your optimism and, and uh, Philip Roth's book, Optimist Leader, because he's uh, wondering if it is too late to restore American leadership and also because it is a very expensive toy to be a leader. And in this sense, if you allow me, I would like to complement this question by asking if uh, and to what extent the, the US American opinion and politicians are aware uh, of the perception uh, coming from the rest of the world, uh, Europe and China, for instance, regarding mm. the US leadership. I feel that there is a widening gap, uh, particularly on the two sides of the Atlantic Ocean between uh, uh, the European perception, also in terms of societies and so on, and the US perception. I don't know if there is awareness on, on, on that. And, and then, of course, uh, Salvador is asking if, if the US is not the next candidate to assume a leadership, then who could be another candidate? Uh, let's stop uh, here for the questions of, for, for now. So if maybe Craig, you would like to address that? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, to speak to both of those points. The awareness of the gap, the, the awareness in the United States of how uh, we are perceived in the rest of the world. This really speaks to the fundamental divide uh, that we have and if you'd asked me to speak for an hour rather than, than a shorter period, I would have begun by saying that there is a lengthy tradition in the United States of a divide between that segment of the public that wants to be engaged, that cares about these matters, and that segment of the public that either uh, doesn't care about it or is actively disinterested, that tries to, uh, uh, that is very active in the promotion of notions of isolationism. And this goes back all the way to the first administration under George Washington and the position held by Alexander Hamilton versus Thomas Jefferson. But uh, not to run through the entirety of the history, when, when we speak of Donald Trump's base, we're talking about people who not only will be unpersuaded by any sense of a loss of, of American influence in the world or loss of American prestige, they so actively dislike the rest of the world that to some extent they think this is a good thing. So uh, part of Trump's appeal is to groups of people who want him to make a stink. They like the stink. Uh, and, and part of this is determined by geography. You know, we're one of the few countries that could really get away with being truly isolationist. If, if every country in the world suddenly put up walls around itself, there's a lot of places that couldn't feed themselves, for example. The United States could. The U.S. dependence on, on trade, both on imports and exports, is one of the smallest in the world. If you look at trade as a percentage of GDP, and I always look at these numbers coming out of the World Bank, 
uh, it tends to be a, a function of the size and diversity of an economy. But we are in a position that we can get away uh, with, with this sense of isolation. What has historically been the case is the people who care about how we are perceived tend to be wealthier, better educated, more engaged with the world, uh, and they also tend to be more democratic. And so uh, an awful lot of it, you may think I'm being reductionist by bringing this down to the question of who wins the election, but that has an awful lot to do with it. Uh, because the Democrats, as I say, are the more internationalist party, uh, the Republican foreign policy establishment really is represented by people like John Bolton, who does not love internationalism, does not love international organizations. I had the experience of spending a little bit of time over at the United Nations when he was the U.S. ambassador there, and the, the palpable sense of, of, of the distance between the United States and the rest of the world as you, as you spoke to, uh, to other countries' diplomats was, um, was inescapable, let me put it that way. So yes, there, there are those people who are very aware of this gap. There are people who understand that there has been a decline in American prestige, but rather tautologically, the ones who are aware of it are the only ones who care about it. And there are others who, for whom this is not a bug, this is a feature for Donald Trump. Now, the, the question of who's next, I've often dealt with this, with this issue, and in fact, it's one that, that, that I discuss uh, in my book on, on trade and American leadership. Um, who's next? There's basically three arguments about uh, where you could find leadership in the global system. Uh, and it comes down to the EU, China, or a kind of distributed global democracy. And I'm skeptical about each one for different reasons. And I'll say this uh, with apologies to my European friends who are about to be insulted, but my impression is that you don't remember your Machiavelli. Because Machiavelli asks, should, should the prince want to be loved or feared? And the answer that you always get from, from our EU friends is, well, we want to be loved. Well, what Machiavelli will tell you is that the prince has to be prepared, depending on the circumstances, to utilize fear or love, depending on what, needs, uh, what you need in order to motivate others. Donald Trump's a perfect example of someone who only knows how to manipulate fear. And he is a failure. If you look at how the EU promoted new issues going into uh, what was supposed to be the Doha Round and is now just a mess, uh, the United States very effectively advanced new issues under the Reagan administration back in the 1980s because they were able to utilize the instruments both of love and of fear, both of trying to persuade countries uh, with, with rewards, trying to punish countries with, with retaliation. And my sense is that my European friends just don't have the stomach for using force when force may be needed. And by force, I don't mean military force. I mean leverage that puts you in a position of no longer being loved. And when it comes to China, and I know we have some friends from China on board, so I apologize in advance if, if, uh, if you find this insulting, but my impression of China is that, or of China's place in the world, is that very early in the process of, of China being a challenger to American hegemony, other countries are responding negatively to the way that China is, is, is pursuing its interests in a rather heavy-handed way. I've spent a lot of time working in Africa in the last five or 10 years. And there's many African countries that I have gone to um, working on projects with UNCTAD, with, with, with other institutions. And I notice the growing Chinese presence there. And I also notice a growing resentment uh, on the part of officials there. Uh, something like the Belt and Road Initiative, I think in the course of just a few years, there has gone the impression of this being China providing public goods to China creating a debt trap. Uh, I, I began my remarks by talking about um, uh, literature and how interested I am in, in exploring the ideas that are presented in novels. If you want to get a sense of how a heavy-handed country can lose friends and lose influence, uh, read The Ugly American. The Ugly American is a novel 
written in 1958, if I remember correctly, uh, but just everywhere where it says something about what Americans were doing wrong at that time, ask yourself if Chinese officials are doing the same type of thing. Uh, my sense is that, that neither the EU nor China are in a position to provide that sort of leadership. And then the question is, can you have a distributed democracy? Uh, can you have global public goods? And a lot of this comes down to the question, and we can be technical about discussing the nature of public goods and who can provide public goods. But my impression is that public goods being very expensive to provide is extremely difficult to get everyone to ante up what is necessary in, in order to create them. And the public good that interests me is the creation of a global trading system. There's other types of public goods as well. Uh, we have an experiment, and a good natural experiment that's taking place right now, which is the question of, with the United States having left the WHO, is the WHO as a consequence going to function better or worse than it did with the United States in the room? Uh, so uh, I will watch that with great interest and, and urge you to do so as well. I will just say that speaking from my own reading of history in the past, I'm rather skeptical of trying to have leadership without a leader. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to add something else, Greg, on that? No? No, no. It's, it's okay. No. Uh, yes. Uh, well, we, we have two questions here that are more related to the domestic front, but of course they will have an impact also on the U.S. Uh, foreign policy, and it concerns uh, Biden uh, vice presidency related to the role of uh, two internal issues, again, with the, with the foreign perspective, uh, race and gender. Uh, do you think that um, Joe Biden will, uh, will take uh, for his vice president candidate, a, for instance, an Afro-American woman to take care of these concerns on gender and race? And, and does he need that to, to win? What role will play these gender and race issues in the current context, of course, the very recent events and so on? And, and maybe there is an impact also on these gender and race issues, an impact on the future US foreign policy and image perceptions also. If you would like to, to address that. Yeah, this, it's a very interesting question, a very important question in my view, not simply because this has an impact on the outcome of the presidential election. Although I will tell you that scholars who, who, who look at vice presidential choices and ask how much of an impact does this finally make on the outcome, uh, find only mixed evidence. Uh, we, we've had examples of vice presidential choices who uh, the candidate did not even carry the state of that person. So um, uh, when Bill Clinton chose Al Gore to be his vice president, that did not bring along Tennessee to the Electoral College. But yes, it does have an impact um, in, in, on the election, possibly. It has a greater impact on the question of who's going to be the next president. Because I'll give you two different scenarios. One scenario is Donald Trump gets reelected and then another Democrat runs against him four years later. Second scenario is Joe Biden gets elected, but he serves only one term. Remember that the man is 78 years old, and four years from now, he will be 82 years old. And I would not be the least bit surprised if he said at some point, you know, one term is good enough, and then whoever is his vice president is going to be in the inside lane to get the Democratic nomination. Now, whoever he chooses has a very strong possibility then of being the Democratic candidate either to succeed Biden four years from now or to succeed Trump four years from now. So when he, he goes to the stage and says that he's selected Kamala Harris, which is what I expect him to do, uh, look at Kamala Harris as being either the 46th or the 47th president of the United States. Now, Kamala Harris is, is a woman of, of, of both African and Indian descent, uh, definitely female. Uh, there's a uh, an argument against choosing her because she's from California and California is in the bag for Democrats and there, there's no further influence of, of bringing along California's 57 electoral votes. But leave that to the side. Stacey Abrams would be a better choice 
because she would bring along possibly the votes of Georgia, which is currently more of a red than a blue state. But those are all those are all just um, you know electoral calculations. Who would be a good vice president? Who would be a good president? Uh, Kamala Harris is very impressive. Uh, there are others who are under consideration. I would say that in the absence of the current racial issue that we have today, there's a very strong chance that his choice would have been Amy Klobuchar. Amy Klobuchar is a senator from the state of Minnesota, where I came from. She was born about five months after I was born and about five miles away from where I was born. So she was my candidate, but she's no longer considered viable, both because she was a prosecutor in Minneapolis, which leads to a question of, why do we have the mess that we have in Minneapolis today? Uh, and also, she's a white woman. So there's, I, I think it would be almost impossible at this point for Biden not to uh, select someone who is a woman and an African-American woman. And of those who are under consideration, I think Kamala Harris is the one that most people are expecting. If he asked me, I'd say Susan Rice. Susan Rice, I'm sorry, Susan Rice. Susan Rice has a lot of foreign policy experience uh, and a, a very good head on her shoulders, but, but so does Kamala Harris. So uh, that is my expectation. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can convey your preferences to the White House. Uh, there is a question from Taymor regarding uh, the Middle East uh, uh, foreign policy of the US. Uh, how do you envisage the role of the U.S. in the Middle East, and particularly in the case of Iraq? Uh, and then a second part to this question, but is, uh, if I understand correctly, it is not closely related. If you think there will be a group greater focus on trade expansion and multilateralism, more or less you already addressed that in your previous remarks. I don't know if you want to come back with further details. Over to you, Craig. Okay, well, I, I, there are a few things I want to say about that second question as well. Uh, the Middle East, um, I, I don't anticipate uh, I issues of Iraq, per se, to play a very important part in, in the election because the United States has largely uh, uh, withdrawn uh, from Iraq. Uh, the Middle East in general, of course, is, is always uh, a, a tricky issue. There's a, um, certainly... Uh, every American presidential candidate does what he or she can uh, to, to show support for the state of Israel. Uh, and currently, you have an American president and a, an Israeli prime minister who are uh, quite close. Each one of them, however, has their own uh, domestic problems. Uh, but that's always going to be an issue. Uh, the Republicans are always surprised, however, no matter how many favors they try to do for Israel, uh, the majority of, of the American Jewish vote is, is in favor of Democratic candidates, I believe, primarily for domestic social reasons rather than reasons of foreign policy. Uh, but, but when it comes to the election, I don't, I don't really see it being that much of an issue when it comes to what U.S. policy towards the Middle East would be under Biden. I have to admit, I have not really given that issue enough thought to give you a thoughtful answer. Uh, on trade and multilateralism, one thing I didn't mention, uh, but, but merits mentioning, is we do have a number of bilateral negotiations that are currently underway. The United States is negotiating free trade agreements with the European Union, with the United Kingdom, with Japan, and with Kenya. Uh, it, there's a long tradition in the United States that there are very few important trade negotiations that are initiated and completed entirely within one presidency. So if you look at almost every multilateral negotiation, if you look at almost every free trade agreement negotiation, the president under whom the negotiations are concluded and approved and implemented is at least one president after the president who initiated it, and sometimes it's two presidents after. So uh, assuming again for the moment that Biden is elected, uh, it seems to me that it would be too difficult, too embarrassing to withdraw from any of these negotiations. So by definition, unless they are completed in Trump's term, and the only way that I think they can be completed is if they want to do a fast and dirty agreement. And there's some indication um, that they will try to produce what 
none of us would call a free trade agreement, but Trump would call it a, a trade agreement, uh, certainly at least with, with Japan uh, before, the, uh, before the end of his term, in order to present it as an opportunity for U.S. exports. But assuming we're talking about bona fide free trade agreements covering substantially all trade and, and all of those things, uh, these four FTAs are likely to be inherited by the Biden administration and would then be an important part of, their, uh, of the conduct of their trade policy. And you could reasonably ask yourself, uh, what's left for the WTO if the United States has FTAs with Canada and Mexico already, the European Union, the United Kingdom, Japan, what we have essentially is FTAs with everybody but China. And increasingly China, the, the WTO is going to be seen in the United States as the place where we deal with China. Because everyone else in the world is either A, an FTA partner, with whom our bilateral arrangement is the principal definition of our relationship, or B, some other smaller partner with whom we can address issues outside of a WTO context most of the time. So unfortunately, I think a lot of the um, acceleration of the move of the United States out of the multilateral system is baked into the cake. Uh, and I have been arguing for years and years that it would be a very bad idea for the United States to enter into FTA negotiations with the European Union or Japan uh, and now with the United Kingdom post-Brexit uh, for precisely this reason, because I think the multilateral system is important. And the moment we start to see the multilateral system as being really bilateral relations with China under another name, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very bad portent for the future. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have an interesting comment from David here that goes back to your remark regarding Machiavelli on love or fear for a leader. Uh, and he, he points to the issue of maybe the EU would be better served to cozy up to the big money, meaning mainly China and some NGOs and other players, I guess. And when the US has the will and the means to offer attractive leadership, attractive leadership, it would be necessary to put its resolve to the test. Uh, maybe you would like to comment on that. I think it's an interesting issue before we go back to some other presidential issues. Well, what you're really asking me is to comment on, on the EU's interest in, in its relations with China, which is something about which I feel I, I probably know considerably less than other people in the room. I look at it as an outsider. I have been told by people with whom I speak, and perhaps some of you can tell me whether this is your impression as well, that what I was referring to earlier about the loss of prestige of both the United States and China as a consequence of, of the pandemic uh, is particularly acute with respect to the European view of China. Uh, is, is, that, is that your impression as well? I, I guess so as far as I am concerned, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I would not want to take a schadenfreude approach to, to foreign policy, although a lot of Americans would, which is anything that's bad for China must be good for us. That, that's very unfortunate that we have ended up uh, in that type of posture. And yet I would say that for uh, a large segment of the American public and an unfortunately growing segment of, of our foreign policy establishment, uh, that's, that would be viewed as a positive development uh, and that's the world we live in today. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I would like to go back to a question regarding multilateralism uh, because Simonetta points to a, a sort of, uh, of a rule that is uh, being commented a lot uh, these days that also refers to a uh, Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN remarks on two years ago, that if you have a multilateral system with many leaders, uh, too many leaders means chaos and therefore a sort of a weakening of the multilateral system. Would you agree with that view? From the US perspective, of course. Well, well, well definitely. Um, now, when you talk about the relationship between leaders, of course, uh, there's also a question of whether you have a community of interests. So 
if you look at how the GATT and WTO system developed, really the United States left much more influence historically, and this is in my book and you can read it, uh, much more influence to the United Kingdom than was strictly speaking necessary. The United States was in a position at that time if it wanted to essentially to dictate terms to the world. But in fact, we had a very close relationship with the British. Uh, I still call them the cousins. Uh, uh, a lot of other people think of them as the cousins. I've enjoyed, now I don't get to because we don't get to travel anymore, but I've been traveling to London for the last three years, training people to be trade policymakers again because they, they lost the knack of doing that while, while, while being in the EU. Uh, but there is, an, there is a natural sense of affinity between American and British policymakers, and we work together well. And then this transferred over to the European Union and then eventually became the Quad. And so the Quad was the United States, the European Union, Canada, and Japan. And of course, Japan was, was, was an interesting newcomer to, to that role. And yet, we worked well. Why? Because there was a community of interest, not just on economic issues, but on security issues. And part of what I deal with in my book is discussing the difficulty that we face when there is a bifurcation of, of the issues that we deal with. As long as you had a system in which the countries that were asked to cooperate with one another in providing leadership were not only economically in sync with one another, but were part of the same military alliances, that was relatively easy to do. May not have looked that way at the time, we had a lot of conflicts, and yet fundamentally, if you think about it, the NATO system and the GATT system uh, developed hand in hand with one another. What we have and also in that period is it was much easier to do that because the Soviet Union was autarkic. And the Soviet Union was not economically engaged with the world and eventually the Soviet Union became an economic basket case and we, we all saw what happened. But Japan, which was economically a powerhouse, was not, in security terms, a particularly powerful partner. And so we had a United States that was able to deal with an economically strong Japan that was militarily weak. And in an alliance against a militarily strong Soviet Union that was economically weak. And in fact, it turned out to be relatively easy to thread the needle as long as we had this confluence between our economic and our security relations. Now, what happens when you've got China, which from the perspective of a lot of American policymakers, looks like you took the Soviet Union of the 1950s and the Japan of the 1980s and they create a love child. And you've got this country that is both militarily and economically strong that has interests very different from those of the United States. So if you ask me, can small groups work together, I'll ask you, what's the small group? Who's the, who is in this small group and do they have a community of interest? Because if they do, if, if our interests are aligned, no matter what our system may be, we'll find a way to make it work. If our interests are not aligned, no matter how good our system may be, we're not going to find a way to make it work. Yes, indeed, um, community of interest rather than just pure love. Uh, there is a, a discussion that is ongoing here on the, on the chat column between Simonetta and, and Mohan regarding Michelle Obama. If, uh, if she could be mentioned as a potential nominate for the vice presidency of, of Joe Biden. And then there is a specific question on age coming from Paul uh, regarding the age of uh, the, the president, if there is some uh, rules that uh, uh, the age is a factor when you become incapacitated, because you mentioned the age of Joe Biden as an issue for a second mandate, a potential second mandate. Remember that you are talking to a great sales, which is an association of senior people. So be careful of what you say about the age. Over to you. Okay, well, uh, that is a very interesting question about Michelle Obama. She has repeatedly said she doesn't want to do this. Uh, I take her at her word. I can tell you, however, two things. One is, uh, if he were to select her and if she were to say that she was willing to do this, you would see an immediate bump up in enthusiasm. It would then decline because these things are always very temporary. 
uh, and she would be put to a test that she's not used to the way a lot of these other people are. She performed her role as first lady outstandingly. I was crazy about her. A lot of people are crazy about her. I, I don't know how well she will do, she would do, if she were put in a debate, uh, if she had to deal with a wide range of issues, although she's a very smart lady, and I'm, I'm sure she, she takes direction well. But I start from the assumption that when she says that she does not want to do this, um, she's serious about it. Uh, I personally, there's one very specific reason why I would not want to see her nominated, which is I'm a very, very traditional person in one sense. I don't like royalty, and I don't like the inheritance of position, and I never like this notion that someone should be automatically considered a, a viable candidate because they are the spouse of, the child of, the grandchild of, the brother of, the sister of, someone else. So I don't like it with the Kennedys. I don't like it with the Bushes. I, as much as I like both of them, I wouldn't like it with the Obamas, but I'm unusual in this respect. So pay no attention uh, to what I say about that. Uh, when it comes to uh, the age and infirmity of a president, we have Article 25, or the, 20, uh, the, the 25th Amendment, I should say, the 25th Amendment to the Constitution. And the 25th Amendment to the Constitution deals with the question of what you should do if the president is incapacitated. Uh, and this amendment was enacted after Franklin Roosevelt had been president. You may recall that he was quite ill and then he died. Uh, what would have happened if he had been much more ill than that? What would happen if he were like uh, President Wilson? You may know that President Wilson, when he tried to sell the League of Nations, had a stroke and was severely incapacitated. And there was a period of time where arguably we had our first woman president because Edith Wilson, his wife, would be presented with a question, would go into a room alone with her husband and come back and give the answer to the cabinet as to what is to be done. And historians to this day are left guessing, did Woodrow Wilson give her direction or did Edith Wilson make a decision? Well, Article 25 is there to provide a means for the removal of a president who has been incapacitated. But the notion is that it would be something like Wilson's case where uh, there's a desire, perhaps even on the part of the president or an inability on the part of the president to reason or or engage in the debate because he's had a stroke or what have you. Uh, but Article, excuse me, the 25th Amendment is written in such a way that it could be used in a way that a president opposes. What it provides is that if the majority of the cabinet, including the vice president, uh, believe that the president has been incapacitated, the presidency can pass to the vice president. Uh, I have told people since 2016, I think that Donald Trump is not only problematic, he not only has issues with learning, he not only uh, has issues with narcissism, I think he has some degree of mental illness. I'll be quite frank about that. Uh, and I've believed that for some time. And I, I have been telling people that I expected that this year we would see more and more examples that would lead others to say that as well. And I think you're starting to see that. I think you're starting to see a number of instances in which uh, he is taking actions that are really thoroughly indefensible. Uh, and the question arises, will there at some point be a consideration of an unfriendly invocation of the 25th Amendment? And I can tell you that there's actually been some discussion of that uh, among White House officials who see references to it in journalism and in, and in books and so forth, always gets hushed very quickly, but it has been a matter of some interest. There was also this in, in the latter months of the Reagan administration. You may remember that Ronald Reagan eventually was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and there is a belief that he had an incident where he fell off his horse when he had another 18 months or so to go in office, he hit his head, this probably accelerated the Alzheimer's, and there were a lot of people who believed, including in his cabinet, in that last year or so, he wasn't up to the job and there was consideration given to invoking the 25th Amendment. It ultimately was not done. So there is a procedure. It has never been used. It's theoretical only. 
Uh, and yet, if you consider the fact that we have one candidate, how, how old is Trump now, 72 or so, I forget, Biden is 78. Anyway, Trump is 70 something and Biden is 78. I would say that there is a almost a 50-50 chance that between now and election day, there will be some serious health issue involving either of these, these people. <coughs> you may remember, by the way, this is not COVID, this is just my like that. You may remember in the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton got pneumonia and she had an incident where she was stumbling about. Uh, the Trump people, who are by nature ad hominem in the approach they take to any opponent, have been doing what we used to call a whispering campaign. And they're not whispering this, they're shouting it. They're yelling it at the, at the top of their lungs that Joe Biden has lost a step. Joe Biden is obviously too old. And frankly, uh, I see it a little bit. Uh, he is a 78-year-old man. Uh, I think that on a lot of grounds, he is far preferable to Donald Trump, and yet you cannot discount the possibility that between now and election day, either one of these, these old men will have a health issue. Donald Trump was rushed off to, to the medical center several months ago, and we've never been given an explanation exactly why or what the results were. But there's a lot of discussion about this with respect to both of these candidates. I would suspect that if you, if you ask me to guess which one is more likely to have an incident of some sort before the election, I'd say Donald Trump. Yes, That's my opinion, by the way. I'm That's sorry. my official medical opinion. I am a doctor. Okay. Thank you for your medical opinion, Craig. Uh, in, in fact, Paul was asking specifically to the period between being nominated and the election day, but I guess there are no regulations according to what you said regarding the age issue. Oh, no, no. Well, uh, when it comes to elections, elections in this country are very odd in the following way, which is they're really conducted at the state level. And within the states, they're actually conducted at the county level. And so there are people who are experts on every aspect of election law, and they will tell you that if you had a, a presidential candidate who, let's say in October, for some reason, we had to replace a candidate for, for any reason whatsoever, you know, the, the candidate was abducted by aliens or got hit by a bus or had a stroke or just woke up one day and said, to hell with it, I'm sick of this, I don't wanna do this. For whatever reason, you had to replace that person you could probably do it in some states and not in others. Now, I will make the following prediction for you. If, if it happened that in some states, uh, let's say Donald Trump was the one, he got taken off the ballot, and let's say Mike Pence was running instead, maybe what would happen is in those states, anyone who was chosen as an elector for Mike Pence, or, or chosen as an elector for Donald Trump, would have the authority to cast his vote for Mike Pence. Because remember, it's ultimately the electors in the Electoral College who decide this thing. And that's actually one of the sketchiest areas of our electoral law. <coughs> These people actually have the authority to vote for someone else. And a few of them have, especially in the last election. Uh, and this is gonna be a very nasty race, and I would not be surprised if people start talking more and more about the possibility that after the election, if we have a close result, let's say uh, Joe Biden wins 275 electoral votes, which is five more than he needs. So Donald Trump needs to swing six electoral votes. He will possibly be the first president in history to try in an overt way to influence electors and try to get individual electors to change their votes which would be insane and would produce an extreme, just requesting it, just pursuing it, would create chaos. But he might do it. <coughs> Back to you, Manuel. Yes. No, thank, thank you, Craig, for this uh, dangerous scenario. Uh, Enrique has a very interesting question regarding the electorate's motivation. Do you think they would prefer the issue of access to employment or equality treatment to minorities in the current context? That's really a, an extremely interesting question because it relates to what to me has been, um, there's a core question that I've been trying to pursue in my own work academically 
uh, for the 40 years that, that, that I've been in this field. The most important unresolved question to me had been, and I say had been because I've changed it, are people motivated by interests or ideas? And your question relates directly to where I've been forced in the last several years to modify my focus, which is I now believe people are motivated not exclusively by interests or ideas, but also by feelings. Because Donald Trump managed to get elected not by appealing to people's ideas, not by appealing to their interests, but fundamentally by appealing to the feelings of people who felt that they had been marginalized, had been excluded with the forgotten man, et cetera, et cetera. So if you ask the old me before I looked at that issue, uh, what will matter more to people, issues of employment or issues of race, I'd say, well, if you happen to be from a, from a minority group, race is going to matter more to you because it, it affects you. But if you're from the white majority, probably issues of, of unemployment for the majority of white people. We're seeing a surprising number, a surprising diversity of people who are coming out uh, and protesting on these racial issues. Well, one of the things I find uh, interesting and amusing and heartening is the number of African-American leaders who are themselves shocked and surprised at how many white people are out there on their behalf. And the term that they typically use now is allies, our allies. And they forget that in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s, you had a lot of this as well. I think one of the problems that we've had in race relations in this country is they went from being uh, a multiracial coalition in support of equality to one where it was assumed that uh, the leaders had to be, uh, and, and the supporters had to be exclusively those people whose interests were involved. But we have a lot of people who I, I think are motivated by fundamental uh, concerns, fundamental feelings of unfairness. Uh, and also they happen to have free time because no one's gone to work because we've had COVID-19. Uh, but uh, the answer to your question is both. Thank you. That complicates a little bit the discussion, I guess, both uh, both at the same time. But anyway, yeah, this is reality. You're absolutely correct. Uh, if, if there are no other urgent questions, I have my own uh, last question that may be probably uh, facilitate your conclusion, the conclusion of your remarks. I mean, not the conclusion of the whole discussion, of course, which is still open. Uh, if I remember correctly, and you mentioned it at the beginning, in the book by Philip uh, Roth on the plot against the US, uh, the context is the war, is, is a military conflict, is, is a big military conflict. And that is the main factor that leads to the change of direction, meaning that uh, it, the US is back on track on uh, uh, being an international leader and, and, and leading to the victory of the, of the military conflict. Uh, so this, um, the war as a factor is, is, is very clearly there, I think. Uh, do you think that we can envisage uh, that the pandemic or climate change, or maybe another military factor, I don't even dare to mention it, could be the triggering factor, the triggering factor leading to a change in the US position in the current context of the next few years? Do you have a crystal ball, Craig? Again, again, it all comes back, and, and I've been very deliberate about this, it depends on who wins the election. Because ultimately, you don't ask the question, what will the United States do about this or that? But the question is, what would Donald Trump or what would Joe Biden do about this or that? Because the question takes on an entirely different coloration depending on each one. But let me turn your question around a bit, just as an example. Um, I wrote, and I would not change it today. I wrote about a year ago uh, that as we come upon this election, if Trump finds himself in a particularly difficult position, if he thinks he needs to do something dramatic in order to win, and he knows what happened uh, the last two times that, that presidents went to war. There was a huge bump up in the popularity of both the Bushes in their respective Middle Eastern adventures. The only problem for George H.W. Bush electorally was there was too much time between the invasion of uh, Kuwait and then Iraq and the election. Uh, and 
he had a huge bump up in his popularity, and then it declined over time, and economic issues caught up with him, and he lost re-election. Uh, George W. Bush uh, invaded Iraq at just the right time, electorally speaking. Uh, he barely won re-election. His popularity was still on a, on a gentle uh, downward trend, but it was just enough. If you're Donald Trump and if the lizard portion of your brain is looking at this and thinking about what to do, you get very interested in military adventures. And between you and me, for instance, a country we both know very well is one that uh, lately we've had indications. John Bolton tells us that in his book that is coming out this week, uh, that Trump had said, you know, invading Venezuela would be cool. Never heard Donald Trump use the word cool before, but he thought that invading Venezuela, he also thought for some reason Venezuela is virtually part of the United States. I guess, I guess he's speaking metaphorically in, 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 in some way. Uh, but the concern that as we get closer to the election, it might not necessarily be specifically an October surprise, it could be an August or a September or an October surprise, but a a military adventure of some sort, and take your pick, there's at least five parts of the world where that could take place. Uh, that could be something that would definitely um, uh, stir things up. And think of it as being like, you're probably all familiar with his march across uh, Lafayette Square. When he walked, marched across Lafayette Park, however many days ago, two or three weeks ago that was, so he could go to the Church of the Presidents and hold up that Bible. An invasion of Venezuela would like be like a very, very big version of that, or a military action somewhere else in the world. And there's many places in the world where one could plausibly argue uh, that there was some sort of, of, of U.S. interest in, in pursuing that. But to get back to your question as you posed it, is there some military issue or other issue that, uh, 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 that would prompt the United States? Uh, Two-part answer there. It depends on which one of these characters you're talking about. And secondly, uh, part of my argument has been that in a sense, the, the driving force for the United States to get more involved is not a traditional war in this case, but what we all started calling uh, the war on the pandemic. So Biden will just argue that he can prosecute that war better. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Just one last question before we, call, we close the chat. Um, going back to the age issue, David is asking about the age of the electors. Uh, are most of the electors old or millennials? And does that age of electors make a difference in the scenario that you foresee for the result? Now, are you talking about the electoral college or are you talking about the electorate? I think both <laughs> would be fine. Okay. Um, all right. Well, the, the interesting thing about age, when, when you get to age and, and, and participation, age and voting, you would get, this is one of the reasons why when you look at public opinion polling, you have to be very careful. Have they asked, have they asked all adults? Have they asked registered voters? Or have they asked likely voters? And one of the main differences that you get between the results of different pollsters is between registered and likely voters because lots of people are registered, not everyone votes. And the two most stable predictors of who is going to vote are age and time of residency in the current residence. So the longer I've lived in a particular place, the likelier that I'm going to vote. The older I am, the likelier I am to vote up to a certain point. When you get to people who are 80 years plus, of course, they may find it more difficult actually to vote. So uh, you get a lot of young people enthusiasm for the left, and yet you don't get a lot of young people voting. And you have a lot of older people who are, who are uh, much more traditional and conservative in their views, much more likely to vote. And a lot of this is now playing out in the long debate we're having over whether or not states are going to allow more absentee voting or voting by mail, because with the Trump people, have no shame about. They're very clear that what they want to do is they want to suppress the votes of young and poorer people, and they want to promote the votes of older people. So what they want to say is, if you live in a state that allows for absentee voting, you should be able to vote absentee, that is vote without going to the polling place, 
you should be able to vote absentee uh, only if you have a very legitimate health concern. And those legitimate health concerns would matter only if you're old. So what they're trying to do, they're trying very seriously to skew the electorate because they know how these models work. Now, when it comes to the electoral college, let me say, <clears throat> this, is, this is a debate that no one had had in the past until the last electoral cycle because it was always taken for granted that every elector would vote the way they were pledged to do. And then we had an election in which we had two very unpopular candidates, and I think there were maybe two or three people who were pledged to Hillary Clinton who didn't vote for her, and there were about three or four people who were pledged to Donald Trump, and they didn't vote for him. And it didn't make any difference in the outcome, but it has made people be aware that there's the possibility that electors may vote differently than they are obliged to. And so at the state level, there's been a lot of consideration given to legally obligating electors to vote the way they are pledged. And this is the issue in a case that is under consideration right now in the Supreme Court. And we'll find out soon. Now, who are these electors? Um, I think they do tend to be somewhat older people. I think in, in many cases they're office holders, but they don't really, they, they don't operate the way the founders thought. When they wrote the Constitution, I think they actually had in mind that it would be like the College of Cardinals. And you would choose these electors, and they, these wise men would go someplace, and they would, through their wisdom, select somebody who was worthy of the office. It never happened. Never happened that way. And there's a lot of things in the Constitution that, you know, it, it, in practice turned out to be different than what was planned uh, by the people who wrote it. Same thing with the WTO. Uh, agreement. There's things that get written into it and then it, it doesn't work out that way. Like voting. We have voting in the WTO agreement. We don't have voting in reality. Thank you so much, uh, Craig. We have to close uh, here now, but we could stay for another week at least, uh, if not even more. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your uh, questions for your crystal ball also, and then we will see if it was correct as we did uh, four years ago. Uh, and then over to Alejandro to close officially this chat. Thank you to everybody. Thank you very much, Manuela, and thank you very much, Craig, for a really very interesting, great talk today. today. Uh, you walked us to historical, conjectural, and you made many, many predictions. And the key words for our film that we're going to put in our website tomorrow it, are really very vast. You touch on trade, gender, race, domestic issues, world, love, fear, interest, age, invasion. So it, it, it's really, it was really full and there are indeed very, very many dimensions. Uh, you started your presentation by mentioning the, the novel on Lindbergh. And I really think that if someone would have written what is going on right now in the world. Many would have said that that would never happen, that would never happen. But uh, I'm afraid that some readers in the future that will read what is going on in this year and these this months in the world, will not believe what happened or will have a different truth. Uh, one of the advantages of living in Switzerland is that you have contact with Swiss media French media, Italian media, German media, media from Austria, Austria, and then you can see that there are many, many different dimensions and visions of what's going on. I am, as, as, as Mexicans, I'm very, very interested in Latin America, and almost every day I read broadly the newspapers in Argentina, in Chile, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Mexico, and the perspectives and the vision that they have is not necessarily the same one that is reflected in, in, in other countries. So, well, you have two actuaries in this uh, session. We deal with uncertainty, and I think this is the, the most uncertain period that we have witnessed in many, many years with an additional variable for us, which is with, I think that we are with incomplete information, which makes difficult things a little bit difficult. Today we had audience from USA, 
your cousins of the UK, uh, Singapore, China, France, Mexico, Sweden, and Switzerland, of course. Thank you very much, Craig, for this really very interesting uh, presentation. And thank you all for attending this great talk. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.